Hey everybody, today we are debating human evolution and we are starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here. Oh, we just, hold on, we just had a picture swap. Um, if, if you guys can do me a favor, is, uh, if this is your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button as we are very excited for today's debate. We've got a lot more coming up, including tonight we actually have G-Man will be debating tonight whether on the future of America and whether or not Christian or atheist moral systems will have a better outcome for America's future. And not only that, but we were excited for, this is the first time I'm announcing it, folks. We are still confirming the venue, but Matt Dillahunty and Inspiring Philosophy have agreed to debate during our first ever mini tour for modern day debate. So that'll be in Austin, Texas, where Matt Dillahunty and Inspiring Philosophy will debate on modern day debate. So it'll be in real life. We're very excited about it. And also, uh, we do have the one, the only, the legend, G-Man will be co-modding for me. You see G-Man on the bottom right. We have our boxes reorganized as uh, it's going to be a fun one. And want to let you know, we are so thankful to have both Erica, who it's her first time here. We really appreciate you coming to hang out with us, Erica. It's a pleasure to have you. I'm glad to be here. And we have Kent Hovind returning as uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Glad. Thanks so much for coming back again, Kent Hovind. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. They are both linked in the description. So if you're listening and you're like, hmm, I like that. I want to hear more. Well, you can hear more by clicking on those links down right down there in the description down there in that little box. So with that, it's going to be a pretty kind of easygoing discussion. So the way the format's going to go is just so each speaker can kind of, each speaker can kind of make their case, they'll have a roughly 12 minutes opening statement, and that's kind of flexible. And then basically open conversation for like 40 minutes or so, and then a little bit of Q&A and closing statements. So with that, I don't want to take any more time. If you have any questions, shoot them into the live chat. G-Man and I will be fishing those questions out of the live chat, and then we will be asking them at the end. So thank you very much for being here. And Erica, I have the clock set for you, and the floor is yours. All right. Okay, my name is uh, Erica. I go by Guts at Gibbon on YouTube. I do videos on anthropology, uh, paleontology, things like that. I got my undergraduate degree um, in animal science and I uh, picked up a minor in biology and one in anthropology as well. And I'm currently getting my uh, master's degree, master's of research in primatology. So human evolution, it's kind of undeniable. So I'm going to start with a statement that both myself, Kent, G-Man, James, his audience, the entire audience watching, we're all apes. And uh, this is because one doesn't ever outgrow their ancestor. You are what your ancestors were. And everybody knows Carlos Linnaeus, the uh, father of taxonomy. Um, and he was the first guy to kind of say, all right, let's have a classification system for everything. You know, let's, let's figure out a way to, uh, to give living things um, a, sort of, a sort of organization. And when he decided, uh, when he was trying to figure out where humans were going to go in this, in this, uh, this sort of system, he had a few problems because he could recognize that humans were indeed eukaryotes, where organisms made up of one or more nucleated cells and were animals because we have uh, animal cells. We can't produce our own energy and we don't have cell walls. We have uh, cell membranes. He also recognized that we were indeed chordates because we have nerve cords. You can see here, this is a human embryo at uh, three weeks, a little notochord right there. He also recognized that we were vertebrates because our spinal cord is protected by our vertebra and we're mammals because we all have body hair. The females of our species can produce milk to feed our young and we have a four chambered heart. And he also noted that we were eutherians because we all have belly buttons indicative of our ability to produce live young. But he took it a little bit further because even though Carlos Linnaeus was indeed a creationist, he also recognized that humans were, according to morphologic traits, which is how he uh, classified things, uh, how they looked, that humans were indeed also primates because we have large brains relative to our body size. We have these dexterous hands, flexible shoulders, and binocular color vision. He also recognized that we were haplorines because we can't synthesize our own vitamin C and our noses are dry rather than wet. You go up to a ring-tailed lemur, you stick your hand in its face and you touch its nose, it's going to come back wet, or your dog or your cat. Not so with us, not so with the haplorines. 
we also don't have split lips. We have the remnant of it. You can go and look in the mirror and see it for yourself. I like to keep these things, these morphologic traits, things that you can see yourself or you can stand in front of a full length mirror. Linnaeus also recognized that we are simiaforms or anthropoid primates. We have these complex social systems with which we uh, communicate with others. And we also have unique structures with regards to our hind feet, our teeth, our orbits, things like this, and an even larger brain to body ratio. He also recognized that we were catarines. If you look at this rhesus macaque, you'll see his nostrils open downward, just like yours. And unlike this white-faced capuchin, whose nostrils open to the side. And if you pop that rhesus macaque's mouth open, you'd find that it has the same dental formula as you do. Two, one, two, three. That would be two incisors, a single canine, two premolars, and three molars. Also, none of the catarines have prehensile tails. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure that I don't. I wish I did sometimes, that'd be kind of cool. We're also hominids because pop open the mouth of you know, an orangutan or a gibbon and you'll see that they have a Y-shaped molar pattern. This is unique to the members of the hominoids. We also have even more reduced caudal vertebra. That tailbone is shrinking even further and we all have an increased uh, ability towards bipedality. You'll see gibbons walking on two feet more than you'll see, say, a rhesus macaque. So we reach the hominids. Now hominids, all of us use tools. We all have a sort of protoculture in that we teach tool use to our young. We all have these long gestational periods, eight to nine months, and all of us have long parental care periods. We, you know, this is so that we can kind of nurture those big brains. But to be a hominid, if you're not a human, every member of this particular group, this family has at least a 96% genomic similarity to the members of the group. So with this in mind, we look to the leopard, uh, Panthera pardus. Panthera pardus is a member of the genus Panthera, but it's also still a felid. It's still a carnivore. It's still a mammal. It's still a chordate. And similarly, humans, although we are a member of genus Homo, we are still hominids. We're still primates. We're still mammals. We're still chordates. So when Kent talks about um, moving from one kind to another, or you know, you're never going to see an organism change orders. They only further special. So there is no way to classify the primates morphologically or by phylogeny and exclude the humans. We're gonna talk about phylogeny in just a second. You could theoretically propose a soul or something like that, but it's not empirical, so it's not science. Morphology, that is. So let's talk about genetics for a moment. I've seen Kent talk about uh, chromosomes and uh, things of that nature, but chromosomes, while genetics is by definition a means to tell relatedness, Chromosomes aren't necessarily uh, the, the end all be all, so to speak. As Kent's mentioned before, tobacco and chimpanzees, they both have 48 chromosomes. And that would be absurd to say that chimpanzees and tobaccos, um, you know, and tobacco are as closely related as say humans and chimpanzees. And this is because organisms that are closely related have similar chromosome numbers, but that isn't necessary to actually forget that point, Never mind. Humans with Robertsonian translocation have 44 chromosomes and they can produce fertile offspring with a standard 46 chromosome human. So it's important to note here that chromosomes don't necessarily determine relatedness. As I was saying previously, organisms that have similar, that are indeed related have close uh, chromosome numbers, but close chromosome numbers don't necessarily mean organisms are related. If we look at this, orangutans and gorillas, I think most creationists would say that they're both in the ape kind, but they certainly can't interbreed even though they both have 48 chromosomes. Same with tobacco and potatoes. But a donkey and a horse can interbreed and produce mules, which are very occasionally fertile despite having different chromosome numbers. This is why we don't use just chromosomes when we're trying to tell how related something is to something else. Instead, we use, I need just some cool hybrids that I just put a picture of because I like them. Instead, we use entire genomes. Now, if you take your genome and you compare it to your mother's or your father's, it's going to be much more similar than that of a stranger's. Same if you compared it to your grandfather or your great-grandfather. And the same is true with species. Because when you compare the entire genome of a human being and that of a chimpanzee or a bonobo, any member of Bean's Pan, you're going to see a 96% similarity. And if you narrow that down just to coding base pairs, that number rises to 98%, 98.8 actually percent similar. Now, the cool thing about this is that when you line up all the great apes, including humans, so you're lining up the chimpanzees, the orangutans, the gorillas, bonobos, and ourselves, bonobos and chimpanzees are actually most closely similar to us genomically than they are to gorillas or orangutans. So we're each other's closest living relative. Now, the reason I keep harping on the fact that genetics does necessitate relatedness is because 
a paternity test is simply a dumbed down version of the genomic process of comparison that I just mentioned. So if we're going to throw out this, we have a lot of courts to contact because we're going to have to throw this out as well. So I know, you know I've seen Kent through debate with um, with Bill Ludlow before about how you know bones are, are just things in the dirt. They don't hold up in an honest court of law. But both paternity tests and fossils both are admissible in court. Uh, the fossil expert testimony of a paleontologist was in Kitts Miller versus Dover. And of course, this is a page from back in the UK, um, court ordered paternity tests, which are indeed uh, considered a, a solid means to tell relation. So speaking of paleontology, let's talk about it because I love fossils. So obviously this chimpanzee and this human are very, very different. They have a lot in common, but they also have unique differences. There are traits that are unique to the human skeleton. So we can make a prediction. Given that our common ancestor was very similar, if evolutionary theory rather proposes that our common ancestor with chimpanzees was very similar to a chimpanzee, we should see the human traits emerge in the transitional forms from that species to modern humans through geologic time. That is, if evolutionary theory is viable. And I maintain that it most certainly is because we have a plethora of fossils. Now, I've also, uh, I've, I've heard Kent mention before that an individual uh, that you find in the dirt, you can't prove that it had any children. But I think that's kind of missing the point because individuals don't evolve, populations evolve. So when you find an individual in the dirt, it can be fairly reasonably and statistically significantly assumed that that individual was a member of a population and not an odd man out. It would be similar if there was a volcanic eruption somewhere near my house, the likelihood of, uh, of a genetically uh, typical human being buried rather than someone with an odd morphologic condition being buried and fossilized, you're probably going to find a, a higher representation of the type specimen of humans. So can we see a general trend of ape-like to human-like or anatomically modern human-like through geologic time in the fossils? I maintain that we can. So let's look at the ape-like hominids. I love these guys. The artipits and of course the Sahelanthropus chedensis. I love these guys. They may look like just your average run-of-the-mill chimpanzee, but there are some key differences. Aurora tugendensis' femoral head is very distinct for bipedality. This means that they held their legs more likely underneath them rather than trying to knuckle walk around. That's also confirmed in the finger structure. Additionally, they have these small canines in comparison to that of chimpanzees. And of course, the brain case. What makes humans special? We're really, really smart. And so, these guys have around a 350 to 400 uh, brain case size, which is unique. And, and we're starting to see this, this emergence, this, oh, this ascent. So let's check out the mosaics. Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, then we have Anamensis, and of course, Africanus. Are these guys truly mosaics? Can you indeed make that case? I maintain that you can for several reasons. One, the foramen magnum is much, it's much more ventral directly underneath the skull. Now that's the hole that your spinal cord comes out. If this individual, Australopithecus africanus, based on where the foramen magnum was, was trying to knuckle walk, it'd be craning its neck like this all the time, which would not be very advantageous and would probably be selected against. It also has an inline big toe, just like we do. A parabolic palate, just like we do. It's actually more intermediate, but still much more so than that of a chimpanzee. And look at the knees. The carrying angle is much more similar to ours. They're valgus in nature much more so than a chimpanzee whose legs are bowed, bowed out to the side. Now, I know we talk a lot about kinds when we're discussing evolution, especially in a, in a creationist conversation. And I've, I've heard Kent say before that, you know, you, you bring a five-year-old up here, they'll be able to tell the difference. And I would invite a five-year-old to come up and tell me which is the odd man out here, because this is a chimpanzee's pelvis. This is that of Australopithecus africanus, erectus, and sapiens. I think a five-year-old would tell us this is the odd man out, and that would mean that this individual is a member of the human kind. And I don't think any creationist would be, uh, would be arguing that. From an evolutionary perspective, this is just another member of our gradient. So early intelligent omnivores, look at this. We've got Habilis, Rudolfensis, we've got Naledi. The brain case is continuing to rise in size. We've got this 700-ish range, um, sometimes even into the 800s. And these guys, while they did walk on two legs, Individuals like Naledi had decidedly ape-like shoulders, which means they could have more flexibility moving upward. This is, of course, a remnant trait. They also still have this weirdly high sexual dimorphism. That is to say the difference between the sexes. And of course, we can sex skeletons fairly easily by looking at their pelvis. And lastly, of course, we have the modern, the, the modern members of Homo. 
all of these guys have lived around, you know, at the same time as each other. Some people call it the Middle Earth hypothesis, that it's like, oh, look at these different species all inhabiting Earth together. I love it. But while all of these individuals use tools, so some of them use fire, some of them had art, and they all had this culture, they were vastly different morphologically because Homo erectus had a 900-ish square centimeter volume brain, whereas Heidelbergensis was at 1,000, Neanderthalensis at 1,600, and Floresiensis all the way down to 350 itty bitty guys. Um, so we see this, this, this cool gradient of individuals that were indeed living at the same time. And of course, this is an incredible picture here. This is several specimens all lined up with one another. And the point here is we're seeing small incremental morphologic micro evolutionary changes, but where can you draw the line? Who are the apes? Who are the humans? It's, it's very difficult. I've been trained in this kind of thing to a degree. I'm definitely not an expert, but even I have trouble saying, okay, well, that's you know, definitively an Australopith or that's definitively you know, member, a member of genus Homo, whatever. Got about 30 small, seconds. Yeah, sure. Small incremental changes over time lead to macro evolution. This individual may have been able to breed with this one, but it certainly couldn't breed with that one. So my challenge, that's the answers if you want to pause and check it out. So my question to Kent would be, to invalidate my ideas here, as I believe I've presented them, you'd have to invalidate relation by genetics, invalidate radiometric gain to prove that they all lived at the same time period, all of those hominids, and formulate a kind that can empirically separate modern humans from the other apes, as well as draw that line in the fossil record. And I'll see the rest of my, my small little bit of time that I have left. Thank you so much for letting me ramble on. Thank you very much, Erica. Very, very fun opening statement. We are looking forward to hearing Kent Hovind. So I've got the timer set. And like I said, these will be flexible. So uh, there's like, I think it's like maybe like 12 and a half to 13 minutes. So we'll do something like that. So Kent, I have the timer set for you and the floor is yours. <clears throat> well, thank you, sir. And thank you, Erica, for doing this. It's obvious they've indoctrinated you very well. We can fix all of that. Not a problem, okay? The Bible says very clearly that uh, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The Bible clearly says 10 times in the first chapter that ever, all the plants and animals will bring forth after their kind. There will be no major changes. You might get a big dog or a little dog, but you're going to get a dog every time. There are no farmers on planet Earth in the history of the world that will tell you they've ever seen any plant or animal produce other than its kind, which is why you guys have to resort to fossils. They say, well, we don't see it happening now, but it must have happened in the past. You certainly have zero evidence in the present for evolution happening. There's no human ever produced anything other than a human offspring. And so there's no chimpanzee has ever produced, any, produced anything other than a chimpanzee. It just doesn't happen. It only happens, Erica, in the imagination, SpongeBob style. You have to imagine, long ago. Well, he's back. We might have him back. I don't know. I think we got him. We hear you. Okay. So I'll stick with the Bible for multiple reasons. There's never been anything scientifically proven wrong in that book, uh, and it certainly makes more sense. Because all we ever observe is chimpanzees produce chimpanzees, squirrel monkeys make squirrel monkeys, you know, apes make apes. There are no exceptions. So what you have, Erica, with probably out being, without, without being willing to admit it, you have a religion. You believe, you believe, capital B, believe that animals in the past could do something that no animal today can do. And your evidence for that is fossils found in the dirt, which I mentioned over and over. You can't prove had any children, let alone children that were different. You can line them up any way you want, but that's not real scientific evidence. The fact that the uh, eyes are different or the nose is different or the attachment to the spine, to the, uh, to the skull, that is not proof they're related because you can line it up once and hold their head differently. And I'll get into that in a minute. The Bible says in the last days, there would be scoffers who would be willingly ignorant and they've swallowed Satan's lie of evolution. And they make these family trees, uh, these timelines, going from nothing exploding for 13.772 billion years ago and nine weeks now since I made the slide. Um, so nothing exploded. Slowly the earth cooled down and became a rock. And in that rock, it rained on the rocks for millions of years. 
and developed a soup and the soup came alive. This is what the theory teaches. I'm sitting in a room full of textbooks, I can show you. This is what evolution says. And then slowly this rock, this single cell creature turned into a primate and the primate became our more specialized species, man. That's what they teach. 13.7 billion years ago, Earth cooled down 4.56987263 billion years ago and formed a rocky crust and it rained on the rocks for millions of years. And here we are the primates and modern man learning how to write 0. 0.00001 billion years ago. This is the family tree, and you, you swallowed it, Erica, and I'm sorry about that, but they do show that man and the apes related. Now, when I taught school, I had some students that really left me scratching my head wondering if maybe they had some ape in them, but no, we don't. <clears throat> the similarities you see in DNA and in structure is just as easily explained with a common designer. If I told you to line up all the cars in the parking lot, by how they evolve from the tiniest one to the biggest one. And so you have all these cars lined up from small to large and you get them gradually getting larger and larger. Is that evidence that it actually happened? Or is that just you arranging things on, on the, in the parking lot? Arranging pictures on a piece of paper like this is not scientific evidence. It's imagination, it's a drawing on paper. They do this to the kids all the time. They give them all these drawings. We came from a single celled ancestor. You said something interesting, Eric. I don't really realize if you understand the importance of it. You said, <clears throat> um, you never outgrow your ancestry. Well, these charts show us starting as a single cell ancestor. Apparently we outgrew that because I have way more than one cell in my body. I think you do in yours also. We did outgrow our ancestry. So I think you need to recognize there's a problem there. Uh, we, now, you're going to say we're still all eukaryote, single cell. We have a single nucleus and, uh, with a cell wall. I understand all that. That's not proof of, any, of anything other than it's a great design feature that works. All the cars I've ever seen have electrical wiring systems. That doesn't prove anything, except you have to have electrical wiring to get the taillights to work and the brake lights and headlights. It's not proof of any ancestry at all. So <clears throat> let's see. Textbooks do, they, do say, though, that we came from a rock. Life on Earth today. Uh, it captured every square inch of the earth, but when planet earth formed, it was a dead rock. How did life get started? And you're, you're specializing in school in learning about uh, <clears throat> how humans evolved from an ape-like ancestor. And they've got all these charts. They say, boy, is this grandpa, a sharp chapter on human evolution. Well, as I mentioned in my opening, the Bible says God made man in his image. And the Bible says at the end of time, there will be people professing themselves to be wise and they became fools. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. According to the Bible, at least, if you don't believe there's a God, you're a fool. That's what it says. And fools despise wisdom and instruction. I, this is my 201st debate, uh, Erica. Uh, the evolutionists, most of them that I've talked to or talked with, despise the idea that there might be a creator. They don't want to learn anything that might indicate their theory they've been taught all these years is wrong. But they despise instruction. They really do. I hope you're not one of those. The Bible says the scorners delight in scorning and fools hate knowledge. Erica, the real knowledge, things that we can see and study and observe, that's what science means, knowledge, is humans produce humans, chimpanzees produce chimpanzees. Now, if you wish to believe, SpongeBob style, that they're related to an ancestor a long time ago, you can believe what you want, but it's not science. And I'll come to your school in London and debate the entire science faculty at the same time with half my brain tied behind my back. You tell them Kent Hovind just challenged the whole school. If I get half the time and we stick on one topic at a time. Let's see, let me skip up here to a couple things for sake of time here. Uh, this article says, he's the daddy of us all. African skulls reveal ancestors 160,000 years ago. This is the kind of stuff they're teaching you and you apparently are swallowing it. Now, Erica, think for just a minute. When you find fossils like this guy, you don't know he's the daddy of anybody. And that, that they've, they've caught on now when I say they can't, bones, don't, bones don't evolve. You can't prove any, they had any children. So now you guys are saying, well, populations evolved. And this represents a population. That's just as dumb. We don't see any populations evolve either. Populations of cows are all over Alabama, and they still produce populations of cows. No farmer will tell you his population of corn ever produced anything but another population of corn. So it's just as dumb to say the population evolved as it is to say the individual. We don't see it happening. 
This article from Smithsonian says, this animal is the mother of all mammals. This is absolutely stupid to say such a thing. Logic 101, if you find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You could not prove it had any kids, and you certainly can't prove it had kids that lived, and you really couldn't prove it had kids that lived that reproduced, and you couldn't prove it had kids that lived that were different than itself. Why do the evolutionists believe bones in the dirt can do something no living animal can do? Produce animals other than themselves. The charts all show us coming from an amoeba to a human. Well, apparently the, the amoeba produced something that was non-amoeba at some point. And a single-celled creature had to become multi-celled. There are no examples, none in the world, of a two-celled or three-celled or four-celled animal. I think the simplest is maybe 20. You have colonies of cells working together. That's not an organism. Every farmer in the world will tell you his cows produce cows and corn produces corn. There are no examples of anything other than that. So I do believe apes can turn to a human because of what we've seen with Bill Clinton. But otherwise, I don't believe, uh, I don't believe it, okay? People say, do you believe in cavemen? I say, well, that depends on what you mean by cavemen. Many people have lived in caves. In the Bible, there are quite a few people. Lot and his daughters, five kings were found in a cave. But there's the world's most wanted caveman. Uh, there was another former caveman lived in a cave. So National Pornographic here said the first pioneer. I think someone's trying to make a monkey out of you, okay, by think, making you think. This guy says, humans should talk like chimps. We should behave like chimps. We should walk around and scratch our armpits and go, hoo, hoo, hoo. That's BBC News. You're going to school over there, for heaven's sake, Erica. Straighten these guys out. Do they really go around at BBC News talking and acting like chimps? <sighs> okay. Well, there's, I go through in my seminar part two of my video series, which you can get for 50 bucks and watch it and return it and get your 50 bucks back. But part two is where I have a whole section on all of the so-called cavemen. Many have been proven completely to be fraud. None have been proven to be intermediary. You can't prove it had any children. A tricycle is not intermediary between a bicycle and a car. It's made to be a tricycle. And it's designed to be a tricycle. So apes are designed to be apes. Humans are designed to be humans. So I go through a bunch of evidence on my video number two, if you like a bunch more on that topic. New York Times in 1912 said, Darwin's theory is proved true. Really? Because they found the Piltdown Man. And you know the story. It was touted as evidence for evolution for 40 years. Reader's Digest said, oh, the great Piltdown hoax. They said, wow, this thing's been in the textbooks for 40 years, and it's a, it's a hoax. Piltdown Man was declared an ape man, 500,000 years old, and validated by many of Britain's leading scientists, including Grafton Elliott Smith anatomist Sir Arthur Keith, and British Museum geologist Sir Arthur Woodward. At the time the discovery was announced in 1912, the New York Times ran this headline, Darwin Theory Proved True. For the next four decades, Piltdown Man was evolutionist's greatest showcase. Featured in textbooks and encyclopedias, I've got them here beside me. What did Piltdown Man actually consist of? What did they actually find? A very recent orangutan jaw, which had been stained to look old, with its teeth filed down to make them look more human, planted together with a human skull bone and stained to create the appearance of age. It was a fraud, and you know that, and most of them know that. I think all of them are hoaxes, frauds, or misidentified or unidentifiable. And they're teaching you this stuff. You're paying money to learn stuff that's going to be proven wrong in the near future. It's wrong now, it just hasn't, some of them haven't been proven wrong yet. I go through Neanderthal man, all the so-called ape men. There are no examples of man evolving from an ape-like creature, none. Some are hoaxes, some are just simply unusual creatures that may be extinct. Uh, Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalus, are ex extinct species of sub or subspecies of ar archaic humans who lived uh, 400,000 years ago. This is from Wikipedia, Neanderthal. Why do they think this is uh, not quite human yet? Well, it has a larger eyebrow ridge, okay? It has a elongated, the back of the head is elongated. Uh, <clears throat> now let me get to some stuff here that'll go in, okay. What does it mean to be human? Picture of the ne time up, Neanderthal man? Good, no. you got about a minute okay. left. Okay, uh, let's see. I got a ton of stuff on Neanderthal. Let me just show you. The Bible says before the flood came, the people lived to be 900, and after the flood, they lived to be 400 for a while, and your eyebrow ridge never stops growing. There are people today, a friend of mine sent me his picture from the side. He said, what do you think, Brother Hovind, am I a Neanderthal? 
Got hair all over my chest, too. Oh, man, you're definitely a Neanderthal. He's still alive in Philadelphia. How about this guy? Is he a Neanderthal? Look at that eyebrow. Whoa, whoa. What is the hump on the back of the skull called? Well, is, is the muscle structure? The fact that we have similar muscle structure, similar bones, this is an example of a common designer. Erica, I'd like to introduce you to that designer. It was God who designed all these things. Lining them up on paper or lining them up in a laboratory doesn't prove they're related. How about this guy? I think that's over in England. Wow. How oh, about ten, this guy? Ten seconds. All right. Well, you go for it if you'd like. You believe whatever you want, but I think you're going to be really embarrassed Judgment Day when God says, Erica, sorry, honey, you got lied to. Go ahead. We are going to go into open discussion, which I, I already have a bad feeling about this. Uh, I think it'll be it'll be okay. Uh, these uh, be even keeled. Uh, we'll try to work hard to make sure everybody gets equal time. So open discussion uh, commences, and the floor is, I suppose, Erica, if you want to uh, kind of lead the conversation at the start. Sure, I would love to. Well, yeah, that's, that's a lot of that's a lot of information I'd like to cover. I, I hope we can get to all of it, but I don't know that we will. Um, so I I've heard the look at the you know look at these orders. First of all, I want to specify massive right. dermatology. Yeah. There's a there's a scratching noise. Are you moving something on your computer or something? I don't know. I don't think that's there, online. Uh, unless it's unless it's G Man. G Man. How many times have I told? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I think it it might there might be something that's like if you if anybody whether it be G Man or Erica or maybe it could be me. If anybody has a mic, yeah, like if anybody has yeah, a mic, she's that's muted. Moving. It's not me. I'm actually yeah. muted. Start her time over. Let her take all she wants. Yeah, yeah. You you guys still hear anything, or are we good? No, it's good. Oh, Perfect. Perfect. Okay. And maybe maybe it was the mic on my headphones. I'll I'll just kind of put that to the side. Okay. So. I've heard, first I want to specify that uh, studying primatology, I just study living primates. So I study conservation of living primates. As much as I would love to, to study uh, human evolution and anthropology, um, I, I actually find the living ones a little bit more interesting. So um, luckily I am putting my money towards something I think you'd prove of, Kent. But let's talk for a second about the common designer thing. Because I know that it's it's quite easy to look at similar morphology and say, okay, you know, use the car thing or the tool thing and say, oh, well, you know what, it's a common designer. But that's why I included all that stuff on genetics, because genetics by definition does indicate relatedness. Um, so I, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on, and, and, you know, kind of tying into that, the reason Neanderthals aren't considered human, at least, you know, human in the sense of anatomically modern homo sapiens, is because their genetics make them unique. So you and I, Kent, we share about 99%, 99.9% of our DNA, but we'd only share about, I, I think the number is like 99.5% with a Neanderthal. Um, so, so, you know, that's outside of the range of, it, pick any two living humans on the planet and that's outside of the range. Um, we could interbreed with them because uh, I actually, funnily enough, my, uh, my boyfriend's father did 23andMe and he got 5% back of Neanderthal DNA. So I guess that's, Maybe cause for concern, I don't know. But <laughs> I, I would like to hear your thoughts on that. If DNA indicates relatedness um, in humans, where, where do you draw that line, I guess? How do you, how do, can you say it's common designer if DNA does, by definition, make organisms either closer or more farly related? Well, I think we can take any vehicles being produced by General Motors. Let's take a Chevrolet Corvette and a Chevrolet pickup truck, I think you'd find tens of thousands of identical parts. I bet the lug nuts would interchange. I bet the spark plugs would interchange on some. I bet they both have a windshield. I bet you'd find thousands of similarities on vehicles produced by Volkswagen or General Motors or anybody and say, wow, there's a lot of similarities here, a lot of interchangeable parts. That doesn't prove they're evolved from each other. They're both designed. So yeah, I think I, the, yeah, the design I, I and the fact that we have you want to go to genetics, which of course is wonderful. It's an unbelievably complex. The genetic code in one cell of your body, you could probably got a hundred trillion cells in one person's body. You can take any one of those cells, take the DNA code out of it and unwrap it and it would tie them together. It'd be over six feet long. One cell, yeah, six sure. feet of DNA. That is the code to make that cell and to make it interact with the other cells. That is like the the code, and it's a four-bit code, you know, C-A-T-G. 
Whereas mm -hmm. our human computers is only a two bit code, zeros and ones. So the codes for Microsoft Word, Steve, how many lines of code in Microsoft Word would be identical to Microsoft PowerPoint? 80% of the lines of code are identical. Does that prove those programs evolve from each other? Or two people with the same brain or similar brain, th similar thinking process are designing the codes. So even if we are 98% similar to chimps and we're not, it wouldn't matter though, that still would not prove common ancestry. It could prove a common designer. But this I, percentage sharing was proven wrong many years ago. Go ahead. Yeah, I um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm following what you're saying with the with the common designer thing and with the example with the cars and and with Microsoft Word. But again, you know, we use genomic comparisons for relatedness in humans. So my 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 point here isn't that, you know, these a lot of these coding um, coding portions, I suppose, code for similar structures, because obviously humans and chimpanzees, both members of the hand, we have hands with five fingers. There's probably coding sections that are almost identical in the code for that because we both have hands. But my point is that genetics necessitate relation in humans and in any other animal. You can do, you know, I used to work for a vet clinic and we had individuals who would send their mutts, their mutts, uh, saliva off or 23andMe type thing to figure out, okay, how much of my dog is Pitbull or how much of my dog is Golden Retriever? How much of my dog is German Shepherd? Because DNA, relatedness, they go hand in hand. That's that's how a lot of those these new big uh, genomic companies make so much money. So I, I'm, I I'm struggling with where you're drawing the line here. If paternity tests, which is literally a dumbed down version of genomic sequence comparison, means relatedness in humans, how can you make the argument that it's not relatedness in between? How can you not see that it's an argument for common designer? I bet if you read all the books written by any, pick any famous author, okay? I bet if you looked at all the plays written by Billy Wigglestick over William Shakespeare over there in England, you'd find that there are lots of similarities in the style of writing. I bet you'd find the, the, the villain is revealed at 38% way through the play, you know, the, the plot thickens. And I bet you could look at any books written. You can look at all the books written in English language, and I've got a library full of them here. All of them use the same basic 26 letters. Whoa. Does that prove they're related, or does that prove that's the code with which you write English, 26 letters? So I think you're seeing something that's true, similarities in genetics, and you're coming to the wrong conclusion with the truth that you're given. Um, I'll give an example here real quickly. I meant to get that ready. Uh, well, anyway, so uh, I agree there's a lot of similarities in the DNA, and there's been a lot of research done on that to try to show some kind of relatedness. If there are similar bones in the forelimb of animals, which there are, does that prove they're related, or does that prove that's a good design? I think I could go to just about any parking lot and show you all the cars have round tires. Does that prove a relationship or is it because that's a design that works? Yeah, and I bet they have shock absorbers and a, a, a suspension system and a windshield. And I think all of them have some similarities because it's a design that works. It's necessary to have these features to drive a car. You have to have a steering system, be able to turn it, not just drive it, but you got to steer it and turn it. A protection from the environment system, a car, a body of some kind. So what you're saying is true. Your conclusion is wrong. That's my point. It's so common design. I've totally with you on the card thing totally with you on on you know the comparisons that you can make between books languages you know, these these kinds of things oh wait erica we can't hear you at all now uh, oh no can you hear me now it's back oh okay must have just cut out there okay can you hear me still yep okay cool so let me put it another way Let's say my mother and I both gave our genetics up, uh, genetic sample to, to, a, to a sequencer. They sequenced both of our entire genomes. Um, they would find that they are probably 99.999% similar because she's my mother. You do the same thing with my grandmother and it'd probably be very close, not quite as close as with my mother, but still pretty close. So by your logic, though, that would be saying, okay, well, it's just a common designer. I'm not actually related to her. It's, it's just a common designer. But my point is that when you have similar genetics, that necessitates relatedness. Yeah, there, it, there is a common design. I'm comfortable saying that between humans and chimpanzees. We look very similar. Our skeletons are very similar. 
Um, both of us use tools. Both of us have compassion. Both of us are warlike. Um, but when you're looking at the genetics, you can't, I don't think that you can draw that line and say, okay, well, when you're comparing the genome between me and my mother, that means it's relatedness. But when you're comparing the genome between me and a chimpanzee, no, that's where it stops. So you need something empirical to say, this is why we draw the line here. And, you know, while I, I respect your opinion and, and I think that, if, you know, from a faith-based standpoint, you want to say, yeah, that's my reason, that's cool. But I don't think that that stands as an empirical um, sort of line of thought. So, okay. so explain to me the difference between me and my mom's genome comparison uh, being relatedness, but not me and a chimp. Okay, I think to continue the book analogy again, if we took all the books written by Shakespeare, all the plays written by Shakespeare, we would find a very high percentage of similarities in his style of writing, the words that he chose to use, etc. I think if you took all the books written by, uh, by any author, you could do that and probably, you know, I bet somebody could read, who was good at English, could read a couple books and say, I think these two books are written by the same author. That's true. And they might find another family of books and say, now these six books were written by this same author. I think that'd be a good field of research. Now, does that mean the two authors are the same? No, no, no. Shakespeare can write some plays and somebody else can write some books and somebody else can write some books. And they're, so yes, I agree. You're related to your mother. No question about that. Does that prove you're related to a mosquito? Do you believe you're related to a mosquito, Erica? I do, and I'd love to get to that um, in a little bit. I actually have a, sl a slide for, I, you know, I love visuals similar to you. I think it's I think it's fun. It's always very satisfying to gesture to something, and I think well, me, people get a lot out of it. But I do sure. kind of want to focus on on this, this, you know, key point here, which is that you do agree that genetically, my mother and I are related if you look at those genomes. So why Correct. can't you use that same logic? between species because you use it within other species. You can do it with dogs. You can take a, you know, my dog's a golden retriever. If you take her, her genome and you compare it to her mother's, they'll be very similar. You could compare her to a wolf and it'd be very, very similar, you know, and you could go farther and farther back if you wanted to. But my question is specifically where you in particular, not, you know, using uh, like books or cars or whatever, but specifically with genetics, where do you as an individual draw the line between me and my mother versus me and a chimp? Why do you draw that line? Uh, did when you did the saliva DNA test on different dog saliva people sent in to you or your lab mm -hmm. whoever did the test did were they able to demonstrate they wanted to know what percentage pit bull what percentage whatever sure did they ever ask for what percentage mosquito it was no I don't think that they would do that because that wasn't the purpose Why that wasn't not? what people were paying money for are dogs and mosquitoes related Erica why don't they find what percentage mosquito is a dog well, I, I really do want to touch on that, but I would like to wrap up the, the genetics between please, please humans do. and chips first. So, so what, what what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think, sure, I'm, I'm in favor of genetics, but genetics are so complicated. This is like comparing all the code in Microsoft Word, finding the zeros and ones, and they've gotten really good at writing amazing codes that can do amazing things with computers. I like them. I use them. Mm -hmm. but, does that, does that, but does that prove the computer happened by chance or that the code happened by chance? This is where you guys go way off the rocker and say, wait a minute, because these code, these, these programs have similarities, that proves nobody made them and they made themselves and they changed themselves. There are no observations to tell us anything's able to change to a different kind. No dogs ever produce different kind. They did produce a dog without exception. That's why you have to go to the past, which of course we can't do, and go to the imagination. We'll see these little changes from Great Dane to Chihuahua. Let's just imagine. No, no, stop right there. Right at that point, you're leaving science. Science is things we can observe, study, and test. That's the definition of the word has been for centuries. It comes from the word seer, the Latin word seer, to know. What do we know? And how do we know what we know? Okay, We know dogs produce dogs. We do not know dogs and mosquitoes are related. Now, you can believe that if you wish, but that's not science. But I've never had an evolutionist once admit when they leave science and go to religion, because it is a religious belief for you to believe you are related to a mosquito. And you're welcome to your religion. I don't fault you for that. But it's not science. I do think you should admit it's not science. You can't possibly know such a thing. And I think you should all, you, evolutionists should all realize this is completely unfair for you guys to force all of us to pay for your religion to be taught to all the kids in public school. Why don't you go start a private school and teach evolution and pay their own way through? I don't want to pay for kids to be taught they're related to a mosquito. I think that's stupid. Now, if they want to, if you want to, I don't care what you believe, but I do care when you want to make me pay for that. That's what I care about. 
<clears throat> sure. Um, I definitely don't. I would get, I would respectfully disagree with you and say that I don't particularly find uh, cladistics or or the genetics that you know supply or supplies certain um, aspects of itself to evolutionary theory um, as a religion. I, I know where you're coming from. I I do understand where you're coming from with that, but I do disagree. Um, so, you know, we, we don't have to talk about the genetics thing, but I guess the point that I was trying to make was that there isn't a line that you can draw. If I'm genetically, if my genomic code is very similar to my mother's, um, and that proves that genetics do indeed lend themselves to how related one thing is to another. Um, and no matter how you cut it, if you're comparing proteins, you know, if you're comparing coding regions or non-coding regions, humans and chimps are the closest to each other. Um, and given that we know genes kind of incur relatedness that would that would be my point but but we i guess you know I, we don't we don't have to talk about that i don't want to talk about the mosquitoes i think, that, uh, I think erica so sorry just i think that there's like a lot of feedback from the mic uh if there's oh for me yeah it seems like it was maybe dragging again sorry that's okay is that a little better now it is that's the one the noise i think yep okay it shouldn't be my mic's just sitting like on a chair in front of me and i got my little headphone thing here is it definitely me? Normally, I would love to blame it on G-Man, but I think in this case, it is you. <laughs> okay, let me see what I can do here. He's just waiting to dance around. You think well, it's dead? You... Erica, let me give a simple, quick analogy while you find the problem on your end. Have you seen the movie The Green Mile with Tom Hanks? Um, the Green Mile, The isn't it based on Stephen King? Oh, yeah, yeah. I love that movie. It's great. Yeah, the Green Mile. It was a fact. There were two girls that came up missing. It was a fact a massive manhunt was organized. It was a fact John Coffey was found holding the two dead girls. These are all undisputable facts. He was found holding these two dead girls. It was a fact he was arrested and executed for the crime. That's a fact, in, at least in the movie, okay? It's also a fact he was innocent. This guy did it, not John Coffey. So sometimes we can look at all the facts and all the evidence and, and come to the wrong conclusion. It's a fact. You have probably a 99.99% similarity to your mother. I agree. You probably have a 91% similarity to a chimpanzee. It's around 91, I think, is the number they're using now. They used to say 98.6, and they're realizing this is nowhere close. It's way off. So, so what does that prove? Well, be careful jumping to conclusions from that, because the same designer, I think you probably got 60% similarity with a clam. It's the same code. I would bet every single computer program whether it's Apple or uh, IBM, all of them use zeros and ones. The binary code is, is there any other codes they use? That's the only code used. But all of them are coming from the mind of a man or, or a woman. They're not coming by chance, an explosion in an electronics factory. They're all being designed by different people. The cars, every car on the road, every single car was designed. Now, some people have different ideas. Some people want the front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, all wheel drive. Engine in the front, engine in the middle, engine in the back. But the fact is, they're all designed. And so lining them up in some kind of fictitious order is not evidence of relatedness. All of them came from the mind of a designer. So the similar codes you find in yourself and your mother, now that is a common ancestry. And I think that's a wonderful field of study. But you're taking that evidence and going to the completely wrong conclusion. John Coffey didn't kill the guy. And you're not related to a mosquito. I'm sorry, you're not. But I think with your example with John Coffey, the only reason we know that he didn't do it is because the narrator of the film or in real life examples, um, when someone has been incidentally executed for a crime they didn't commit, we only find out that they didn't do it because new information comes to light. So in order to say that relatedness shows a common ancestor, you know, uh, genetics shows a common ancestor between me and my mother, but not me and a chimpanzee, without that new information, that reason to state it as so, um, I, I don't think that that is... is uh, very forthcoming, I suppose. But if you'd like to talk to, or if you'd like to, to talk about, because I'll, I'll, if I don't stop myself, I'll just keep harping on that same point because I, I don't feel that I've gotten a sufficient answer. Um, but I would love to talk about the, I, I, the mosquito and dog or the whales and the pine trees, however we want to do it. Because um, I kind of anticipated that you were going to ask that because that is a, a favorite of yours. So here, whales and pine trees, right? Uh, do I believe that whales and pine trees are related? 100% I do. It's very far back. This is a, a nice little diagram of a totally artistic representation. I'm not saying that this is what it looked like or anything, but it's a simple single-celled eukaryotic cell 
uh, probably proteases-like in nature with a mitochondria and a DNA-filled nucleus, et cetera, et cetera. But the key thing here is to note that it's neither a plant or an animal. It's neither, because like I said earlier, you don't outgrow your ancestry, you don't become uh, something that you weren't before. So this individual, essentially, you know, according to evolutionary theory, right, would diversify into a plant cell and an animal cell. Then those two individuals would become multicellular, um, not individuals, sorry, those pop the populations of that individual species would become multicellular and yield simple organisms. You know, I'm sure, you know, like you said, you've taught high, uh, high school science, so then you know that plants and animal cells are very different, but they're very similar as well. And I know I've heard too, uh, you've mentioned, you know, okay, well, what comes first? Then do you, do you become a two-celled animal and then a three-celled animal and then a four-celled animal? Well, there was this excellent paper that came out this year in 2019 on the de novo origins of multicellularity in response to predation. There's some awesome videos showing this happen in real time. And essentially, these organisms, they're, it's a species of algae, are exposed to a filter feeding protist, and these guys live single cellularly um, normally. But in response to the pressure of predation, they begin to clump. And as they clump, they start to reproduce. And those reproduced organisms become a part of the clump. You see what I'm saying? So basically, we're seeing this, this very proto multicellularity. Um, I'm, I'm oh, no, well, let, oh, hang on, this is a discussion here. Let me ask you. You say, uh, they became multicellular. Actually, they became a clump, a colony that worked together. And then you said they began to reproduce. Did the clump produce another clump, or did the cells in the clump produce another cell? Well, Read very similarly, very similarly to how humans do it, right? When um, when a human produces another human, first they produce a single-celled organism. Then that organism proceeds to divide upon itself and produce a clump, or in a human case, a fetus. So blastocysts, things like this, these periods of human embryologic uh, development, where you first you start off as a single cellular organism. So yes, they do produce another single cell, but that single cell builds upon itself as it reproduces. Um, I, I can link you this paper if you'd like. I think I just have the abstract here. If you like, I'll read it. Okay, and you're saying this was just discovered this year? Uh, this was in February 20th of 2019. 2019. How long have they been teaching the evolutionary theory without this evidence? Oh, for quite a long time. But, you know, the point well, of that... Oh, oh, sorry, can you guys hear me okay? Did I drop out? Well, but they didn't have this evidence. Uh, as you think, this confirms it's true. I do not. But so for years, for centuries, or a century and a half, they taught it with no evidence. And now this is the newest evidence you're going to go on? Well, sure. I mean, I would, I, I'm certainly not a geneticist, but as far as I'm aware, at least when I was taught this uh, in my undergraduate, um, the way that we knew that we had this single cellular and multicellular split was one, the appearance of multicellular organisms in the fossil record, which I know you're not a big fan of, but two, again, it's the genetics, right? I mean, when we look to the genetics, you see, I'm sure you're familiar with like endogenous retroviruses, things of that nature. But the reason that they taught it, right, was kind of because we didn't have the technology to actually perform this experiment in and of itself. No one knew that predation was going to be one of the triggers because they tested this on five populations and only two of the five actually switched to multicellularity. Um, I, I wish I could give more information to the whole single to multicellular idea prior to this experiment, but I'm not a, uh, I'm not a cellular cell bio gal. <laughs> I do big animals. <laughs> Well, have you ever seen any of these animals that you worked at in the vet clinic or anywhere else produce babies that were considered a different kind or were no. they? No, no, no. I mean, it depends on what you mean by kind, because <clears throat> as someone who, ex you know, I'm set evolution, I don't believe that organisms indeed change kind. I think this experiment is uh, a really cool example of speciation, right? <coughs> You've got these flies, right? This was done in 1989. You've got these flies that are fed, I think it's sucrose and maltose. That's done for eight generations. You put them back together, reproductively isolated, right? Whatever was going on in these populations while they were isolated allowed for a mutation to occur that reproductively isolated them. Um, I think I, that that yeah. would be, of course, they're still flies, right? You know, I agree. Yes, they're still flies because the law of monophyly, you can't outgrow your ancestry. And if they tomorrow evolved into, or over the course of several, let's say 10 million years, evolved into a fly that was the size of your fist with 10 legs instead of six, they'd still be a member of Diptera, 
they would still be dipterans. They would just be a further classification of dipterans. I hope I'm making myself clear. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't see your picture. Was that a picture of fly population that was isolated and then reintroduced to each other? Yeah, sorry. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Okay, and they're all still flies. Yes, I agree, 100%. And that, and that, and that evidence helps convince you that you're related to a mosquito? Um, I mean, it shows that speciation occurs in a lab, which I've, you know, heard. Not, I don't know if, I've, if you've said this, but I've definitely heard individuals say that, you know, we can't even do this in a lab where the generations are really, really quick. Um, but it happened here, a speciation event. Yeah. These two can't integrate well, anymore. That speciation is kind of a tricky word. I mean, what exactly? I don't think anybody's have a rock solid definition of species. I agree. So, I agree. Yeah, species, Speci speciation be can be tough. Well, see, the Bible says they'll bring forth after their kind. So if you had a dark winged fly and a, a red eyed fly and a white eyed fly, we happen to have a five year old here, uh, Mackenzie. If you saw a fly with white eyes and a fly with red eyes, would you say they're both still the same kind of animal? Yes. There you go, from a five-year-old. Do you think a bear and a fly are the same kind of animal? No. Okay. Now, you talk a lot, uh, Erica, about mitochondria, which is wonderful, and about cells. Clear back at the Life Science Library, they talked about the uh, mitochondrial DNA and the, the cells being so complex, but this article came out in... Uh, uh, Trends in Ecology and Evolution magazine back 20 years ago. If molecular evolution is really neutral at these sites, occurs at a consistent rate, such high mutation rate would indicate that Eve, mitochondrial Eve, lived 6,500 years ago, a figure clearly incompatible with current theories on human origins. But you know, that's not incompatible with what the Bible teaches. The Bible dates add up to about 6,000 years for Adam and Eve. So why did they drop this talking about this mitochondrial DNA? Using our empirical rate to calibrate the mitochondrial DNA molecular clock would result in an average man of the mitochondrial DNA, the most recent ancestor, of only 6,500 years ago. Wow, in the magazine Natural Genetics. This is 20 years ago. They've known that you could trace all the people back with mitochondrial DNA to within 6,000 years. You don't need millions of years. Sure, there are changes, but the changes are limited. They're still the same kind. You may get a big dog or a little dog, but uh, Erica, do you think that, that the changes we've observed, actually we've created in dogs, you know, vets do this, they get big dogs or a little dog. Do you think it's possible to get a dog as big as an elephant? Oh, you, do you want me to give you my opinion yeah, on that? Do you, th do you think it's possible that, will they ever get a dog as big as an elephant? Well, it would take a very long time because at present, dogs walk up on their toes. So similar to an elephant, you would first have to select for these really thick leg bones, right? You'd have to select for something that can actually carry the weight of an elephant um, on top of it, or else it's just going to fall over. It's going to break its legs and be non-viable um, as an organism almost instantly. So similar to how evolutionary theories suggest that animals like elephants do indeed evolve, you sort of have to have these precursor structures already in place. You can't just you know, breed Great Danes until they get that enormous because as of right now, they get hip dysplasia because they're simply right. too large, right? I mean, it, you, but, if, but if you were to focus, I really do think if you were to focus on fixing the problems such as in inability to bear weight on such tall spindly legs, if you were to fix those problems via artificial selection or, you know, I'm not sure what the ethics would be, but, but through genetic editing, um, I really do think you could get a canid that would be as large as an elephant. It would take a long time, a lot of generations, but I bet you could do it, especially now with modern technology. Hmm. Do you think they'll ever get an elephant, a dog as big as Texas? Well, no animals ever lived to be as large as Texas because if it was as large as Texas, what would it eat? That's a good point. How about as large as a whale? You know, there are animals as big as a whale, like a whale. Or extinct Basilosaurus, or lead sick bees, or Megalodon. We have tons of animals sure. that get really big, okay. but they all lead completely different lifestyles. Blue whales are filter feeders. Lead sick bees probably was, but Megalodon and Basilosaurus, were, who were almost as big, you know, the big shark, and then an equally large toothed whale, were both meat eaters. They had to spend all their time hunting. And mind you, yeah. they only existed in a period where other very large animals to feed upon also existed. Uh, I, I, I hope you can see when you go back and watch this video how much of what you're saying is relying completely on imagination. Imagine these animals over millions of years changing. Imagine them turning into something else. What about all the new information that's being added? 
To go from a single-celled creature which clubs together to make a colony to escape predation, how much information would have to be added to turn that into a skeletal system, a nervous system, a circulatory system, a digestive system, integumentary system? There's a whole lot of systems in, in most living creatures, not just clump of cells working together to avoid predation. I mean, there's a lot of new information that have to, would be, have to be added somewhere, somehow. I know, I know you can probably imagine how it might happen, but where's the scientific evidence that it actually happens? Well, Getting I, cells clumped sorry. together it is not creating a new structure. and not, there's, there's no new information in that clump of cells. Each cell is still the same kind of cell. So where does new information come in or new structures? Well, I think it depends on what you mean by information, right? I mean, let's say you have a sentence, right? Um, and as you know, we, we work with uh, all of our, our base pairs, right? You know, adenine, thymine, et cetera, at AC, uh, TG. Um, so we have four base pairs to work with. Now, when it comes to creating these brand new systems, I would point to uh, what we see today with uh, the evolution of feathers or scales or mammary glands or whatever you want to point to, because scientists have actually shown that all a feather is a modified scale. Um, and the way they know that is because birds have both. You can look at them under a system and you can genetically alter a scale and start to get, uh, I think it's a rachis, the, the long uh, backbone of the, actual, of the actual feather. But with regard to new information, it really does depend on what you mean. Because I, I have a hard time with this when I've read uh, Chris just talk about new information. So I'm never really sure what an, what an information is, right? If you have a, if you have a sentence, right, uh, the cat sat, um, and then you have a duplication event. So it says the cat sat, sat. And then you have a frame shift mutation. So now it says the cat sat, or yeah, the cat sat, sad. And then all of a sudden there's another shift and it switches the word cat and sad. And now you have the sad cat sat. Now, the sad cat sat conveys a ton of new information when compared to the cat. And the base pairs you're working with in this situation would be the alphabet, right? So I'm saying the point of this kind of bad illustration, I wish I, you know, I almost wrote it down on the pen and paper, but I couldn't write fast enough. Um, but the point of that is to basically say new information, at least in genetics, is frequently just tweaking of old information. You see what I mean? And then you get a new morphologic result, similar to how if you tweak a scale, you can get something that starts to look similar to a feather. Now, is this, is this scientifically observable or is this imagination? I'm not sure the exact paper, but I'm fairly certain that they actually have gone in um, and genetically altered um, kind of these precursor cells to get a variety of, you know, like, say, a mammalian hair from... Um, Sure, with the, I think it would also be a scale. I think scales came first. Uh -huh. um, and forgive me, I'm not. I wish I had that paper on hand, but I believe that is indeed the case uh, that this has been done. Um, and you know, again, you you could argue a common designer. So you, you got the car there. I agree. In the case of cars, absolutely common designer. Same thing with books. Same thing with computers. But the key difference there is that those things don't reproduce. And more specifically, I was helping my sister study uh, for her biology exam tomorrow she's she's about to go to college next year um and we were actually studying natural selection and how one of the main ways that sexual sexual uh mating pairs mix up genetic information right is genetic recombination between the mother and the father but cars don't do that cars can't have sex and then produce offspring that have a genetically shuffled version of their own genes and that's why you know that would be a great example of a common designer but i don't think you can make the same argument for living organisms that's just my opinion. Okay. A car has quite a few systems. It would have an electrical system, suspension system, drivetrain. Look, but human body has a lot more systems than that. But to add reproductive system on top of that is millions of times more complex. It doesn't make the problem better for your evolution. It makes it much worse. And natural selection, Erica, natural selection selects. It doesn't create anything. You guys keep trying to give natural selection a creative process. If I went through the whole country of England and selected everybody under seven feet tall to be killed, we kill everybody under seven feet tall. You gotta be seven feet tall to stay alive. There's probably only a few dozen people in that country that are over seven feet tall, maybe a hundred of them, let's pick a number. And I keep selecting tall, the tall people to live and if they have babies that are less than seven feet, sorry, they get killed. 
How long would it take me to create a population of 20 foot people doing that? It'll never well, happen. Well, there, you'd have to, oh, I'm sorry. Well, natural selection can only select from what's available. You, you can select rabbits and get brown rabbits, gray rabbits, white rabbits. You're never going to get a green one. Why aren't there any green rabbits? They would blend in good with the grass. You talk about escaping predation. Why haven't any rabbits ever evolved green? It's always brown, white, red, you know, colors that are of a whole variety. We got how many rabbits we got here? I had 10 babies born today. So, yeah. So, but they don't get a green one. You would think, man, green would blend right in. There, there's not, it's not in the gene code. It's natural selection works great. It selects, it doesn't create. You guys want to give it a creative power. It doesn't create, it only selects. Right, and I would 100% agree with you because yeah. from an evolutionary standpoint, right, where's this quote unquote new information coming from? Well, it's coming from genetic recombination and it's coming from mutation. So like I said, with the sad cat sat, right, you know, all of that, that whole alphabet is already available to select from, but different combinations of different letters give you new information. As for the rabbit thing, well, we see green bugs, so maybe the bugs were just er, rather arthropods, uh, certain, uh, I think coleopterans and beetles and things like that. All oh, those scarabs are these brilliant emerald colors. Um, but it may simply be that it's easier for green, at least in the genetic code for arthropods, to appear by a mutation than it is for mammals. Similar for mammals, it's easier for them to, uh, you know, get these nice dappled colors that say a baby fawn has to blend in with the dappled sunlight. Um, so, so I would say, you know, you're right. You know, natural selection doesn't produce new information. I don't. I would never say that. I would say mutation does. Um, and then I would say natural selection acts upon that mutation. And that mutation okay. is a random portion of the of, uh, of evolution. Right. I agree. Mutations happen. There have been millions of really bizarre mutations that have been documented, very well documented. Have any of them added new information? You might get a person with six fingers, uh, hexadecimalism, but that's not a new information. That's the same information duplicated, extra finger. Uh, that's not... It's not turning it into a, a feather or a wing or a beak. It's something they already had in the gene code. Where are the examples from science of new information being added? Not examples from imagination, examples from science of new information, not a duplication of existing information. Well, Do you have any? I guess, are you asking for new base pairs? Like you want something more than adenine and thymine, and guanine and cytosine? Do you want something new there? Um, because I would say you're not going to get that because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's part of the one of the general rules, not rules. It's it's a trend that we see in, in the evolution of species is that why change it if it works so well? There would be no reason, at least that I can think of, that, uh, that, that a new base pair would evolve. With regard to our animals kind of doing this today, do we see new information? Um, again, without quantifying it, I can certainly point, I've got a cool slide here that I like. Um, I can certainly point to animals that are doing cool things today that they didn't previously do. I love the Italian wall lizard uh, example because I studied a lot of monogastrics and ruminants when I was getting doing an animal science uh, degree. We talk a lot about the sequel valves, right? You know, uh, increase the surface area for nutrient absorption. So you've got these two lizards, right? Well, actually a single lizard population. You split them into two islands. This happened, I believe it was 50 years ago now, maybe 60. And then you go back and check on them in 50 years. Uh, they're the pod Mercaru lizards. And all of a sudden, you've got a vegetarian lizard with sequel valves. And none of these previous lizards had sequel valves in their guts. You cut them open, wow, look at that, sequel valves. That's really cool. I would say that you would probably, again, I'd have to know what you mean by information. But you'd certainly have to have something new to see sequel valves evolve in 50 years in a lizard that was previously primarily insect. I, I, you know, I've, I've got a couple more examples here. One from London, because you know, good old London town. Um, and, and mosquitoes, you know, mosquitoes in the underground are a big annoying thing. The underground for the Americans in the room would be, you know, where you take uh, the subway, the train to one location to another. There's a whole population of mosquitoes that's been isolated in the underground that can no longer interbreed with the mosquitoes that live above ground. Um, and they're kind of adapted for that area. It's 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 really very annoying, but very fascinating. Um, yeah, I know you love the Kaibab squirrels. So I got those up there, but uh, some E. coli stuff. These these uh, 
E. coli cells are capable of generating their biomass from CO2. I, I would love to get more into that, but again, I'm not very good with the small stuff. I'm much better with uh, macroscopic life. But I, again, I can certainly share any of these papers that you'd like to see. With you. Yeah, I'd like to see more about that lizard and the new valve you're saying it got. I'd like to do some research on that. Yeah, sure, let's, sure. Let's suppose, let's suppose that's completely true. They have a completely new trait in 50 years. I, I'm, I would, I'm going to question that and then reserve judgment until I see all the facts. But that's fair. Is, is that enough to make you believe that an amoeba or a single cell creature became all the life forms we have today? You flashed by a picture showing all the life forms going back to a common ancestor. I mean, whales, mosquitoes, pine trees, all of them came from, a, from this amoeba by that process you're describing. Do you really believe that? I mean, I, I really do, Kent, honestly. I think that when you see this kind of stuff happening in, in such short time spans, I mean, you've said it before, and I would love to have a conversation with you at some time, at some juncture, if you would like, um, about the age sure. of the Earth, because I know that's a, that's kind of, I'd like to stay with, you know, human evolution, evolution in general here. But you're right. You require a ton of time. If, if you're going to accept evolution, you got to have that time. I would agree with that, at least to get from uh, a single cellular organism to, you know, the, the biodiversity that we see today or in any other uh, era of time, the Permian, the Triassic, wherever you want to go, because there's so much life and there's so much diversity. So you do need the time, 100% agree. Um, but that's a conversation for another time because I have quite a bit to say on it. Um, but right. yeah, you know, I think if you can do this in 50 years, I don't see why not. Um, I, I think the con evidence to the contrary, at least to prove it to you in that aspect, I would almost have to show every single transitional form, not as a fossil, but in media res, like recreate the evolution from uh, you know the molecules to man or whatever um, in real time, you know, which would be impossible. So I don't know. You know, I find this quite convincing. I think it's kind of an Occam's razor thing, right? Okay. Um, but if you don't, that's that's totally cool. You know. Well, I think what we'll do is I want to give Kent the last word since we had Erica get the open conversation rolling, and then we will go to try to get as many. Uh, we'll try to do like really short closings. If you guys would still like those speeches of the five minute or so closings. And then try to get to some questions if we can. So, uh, Kent, if you had anything to for that last point. Well, yeah, I'd love to see. I'd love to see the questions. But this idea of requiring lots of time, I think she's dead right. Without billions of years, the theory is completely dead in the water, completely dead. So, one proof that the Earth is not billions of years old is all really we would need. I mean, there might be somebody with fifty different facts in a court of law. They can prove fifty things that say he's guilty of committing a crime in London on, you know, Main Street. And they got all these facts. But he's got one fact that shows he's got a stamp passport that he was not in London at the time he was in America. Oh, case closed. He's not guilty. One fact will exonerate him. One proof of a young Earth or young universe will completely destroy evolution. And I think you need to watch my video, The Age of the Earth, where I go through about 40 of them. I'd like each one refuted. Any one of them will do the job. Secondly, I would point out, nobody has ever seen any animal produced on a different kind of animal. Even if this lizard had a new valve or had a, a reenactment of a valve it used to have and lost and came back, or if the mosquito population can't breed with the other mosquitoes, it's still a mosquito. Is that process going to create new information and go from an, from an amoeba to a whale? There's a lot of different information has to be added. Like gotcha. all the information, the nervous system, the heart, et cetera. So I... I now, I'd like, uh, um, Erica, to, to see it from my point. Do you understand why such a high percentage of people, especially in America, resent calling what you believe science, and they resent it being required education for their kids? It's not science. You, it, even if it's true, it's not science yet. It's not proven. It's not, demonst not demonstrable. I think for... It's not, uh, unless... it's not part of science. Go ahead. Unless we're going to, okay, I was just going to say, unless we have the official closing statements, I just wanted to make sure that we're still in convo mode and wrap up for the Q&A. So thanks so much. I'm going to try to read through as many as we can. And then uh, if you guys, would you guys like the closings uh, or are you okay with jumping into Q&A? I can jump into Q&A. I'm okay without a closing. Thanks, for, is fine. thanks for your flexibility. People have loved this conversation, by the way. In the live chat, people are honestly just absolutely, they are enjoying it. So 
Uh, thanks to both of you guys for being on again. And just to let everybody know, a reminder, they are linked in the description. You will notice that our co-moderator, G-Man Left, he is preparing for his debate that is coming up in 25 minutes where he will be debating Johnny on which ethical system, Christianity or atheism, or ethical theories from those worldviews, <coughs> Which one is better for America's future? So that will be an interesting one. He is getting ready for that one as we speak. Back to the Q&A. Thanks for your super chat from Ray Chaudhry. He said, let's see, I have no idea what this means. Is sovereign citizenism a religion? I don't Who's know. that question? I, don't, I think it's for you. I have no idea what it means. Um, okay. well, there's, gonna, there's no such there's no such thing as a sovereign citizen. You're one or the other. The sovereign is sovereign and the citizen is citizen. You can't be a, there's no such thing as a sovereign citizen, like jumbo shrimp, no such thing. Gotcha, thank you. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try to fish through for the ones that for sure seem relevant to the debate as that one confuses me. Uh, Tio Gaart, thanks for your super chat. He said, is religion a product of biology? Is that one for me, maybe? Maybe, I think. I think we know Ken's answer. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really fascinating question. And there's actually a lot of, you know, a lot of psychologists, I, I would recommend to this individual to read uh, The Moral Animal by uh, Robert Wright, because um, this, this, this idea of essentially uh, trying to explain the world around you is kind of almost certainly a byproduct of the natural curiosity that humans have. I mean, I would absolutely say that's something that's unique to people. Um, so I don't know. I would love to know the answer to that question, though. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Next up, appreciate your super chat from Steven Steen. Appreciate it. He said, G-Man as mod won the debate. G-Man always wins. Hmm. Thanks, Steven. Ray, uh, Ray, Ryan Gordon, thanks for your super chat. They said, how would an animal survive during the process of growing fins while losing legs? How is it supposed to swim or walk? And why... <laughs> Uh, and and does it grow gills or a blowhole conveniently at the same time? I can assume that one's for me. Um, I think so. Awesome, awesome question. I could point to some cool transitional forms, or we can talk about, say, the lungfish. Um, there, the the uh, the structure of Tiktaalik, or maybe a Canthostega, or Eustenopteron, all of which are considered transitional forms from the sea to the land. You can actually spot in their fossils the, the the structures that show that they could breathe air and also filter water through the gills. Actually, I don't think Eustenopteron is included in that. So it's it's less an immediate, oh, lose this thing, get a new thing, and more, sometimes you've got these awkward looking organisms that kind of have both. Because you're right, you're never going to see lethality um, rise up in the midst of evolution at least if it's if you're you're looking at an end product organism um, as as kind of 2020 hindsight, it's not going to happen. So my answer would be check out some cool transitional forms because they directly answer your question. They got both. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Next up, gotcha. Let's see. Terry James, thanks for your super chat. They said Kent, the textbooks clearly state life came from the ocean. Why don't you mention that? And then they said, is it because you know it doesn't sound crazy since we are made of water? Life came from the ocean and we are made of water. What on earth is that? I would say iron comes from the ground. So cars are made from the ground because they're made out of iron, you know, mixed with carbon and made steel. I don't understand the analogy here. The Bible clearly teaches that God made creatures to live in the water. And he made creatures out of the dirt. Uh, he could make creatures out of nothing if he chose. He made the earth out of nothing. And God, the God can do that. The God that I worship can do all that stuff. So I guess I don't completely understand what his question is. Uh, we don't ever see any animal in the water produce an animal that is different than its kind. Whales produce whales. Fish produce fish. Sharks produce sharks. Does anybody know of any ex scientific examples where an animal has become a different kind? I'd like to see it. Other than, imagine, millions of years ago. Fossils can't count for that. It ought to be happening today. There's a lot of animals on the earth today, like a whole lot of them, and nearly all of them having babies. Why don't they do it today? Why do we have to rely on the past? Gotcha. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And quick question, uh, super chat that I'm pushing to the top because it's such a good one. It's a juicy one. It's one that I'm like, oh, like, c could it just be the case? David Baldock said, Kent, are you going to debate 
Aaron Ra again. And the reason that I was so excited to see the Super Chat is because we'll be on tour in Texas. And uh, I know that, Kent, you had mentioned, you said you were concerned that he would basically speak over you and you wouldn't get a chance to, to speak. And so you said, if I remember right, you said you'd prefer to have it be the case that you can prevent him from doing that. Is there any way we could arrange this debate? Because we would be pumped to host it in our debate tour coming up in a month. I, I think this guy actually will mute him. Okay. Here, I, the, the one time I talked to Mr. Ra, Mr. Nelson is his name. He calls himself R and Ra, the sun god, which I don't believe for a second not bright or sunny, but um, the he interrupted me 288 times in my 36 minutes of talking. James, you let me have control of the mute button to shut him off when it's my turn to talk. I want to be able to shut him up when it's my turn, and we're going to talk about one topic at a time, and yes, I'll debate him if I can shut him up when it's my turn. I will. Otherwise, I won't do it. <laughs> I will I'll ask do it in him. writing. Okay. I I'll, will. I'll do it. I'll respond. I'll respond. I'm going to respond. He's on my list. My whack and atheist program I'm doing. We're having a blast. Whack and atheist. I'm going to put R and Ra on here and I'm going to whack. I'll pick one of his top programs. I asked him to give the best three evidences for evolution. He rambled for 20 minutes and finally gave three evidences that he thought were the best in two minutes and 30 seconds. I spent seven hours debunking those two, two minutes and 30 seconds. He doesn't have any evidence for his religion and evolution's his religion. It's not science. Yes. I'll debate him if it's one point at a time, and I can shut him up when it's my turn to talk. Okay. He won't agree to that. Can, well, if I ask if if we can do it live in Dallas on the debate tour, is it okay if Aaron could have his own to keep it so you guys – it's almost like you both have the nuke button, so you both you both don't want to use it because you don't need the other person to use it. Would it be okay if he has a, a mic button too? No, no. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. But – when it's my turn to talk, I want, I want to be able to finish. Have you noticed during this discussion here, Erica, I don't interrupt you unless I can't hear you or something. I let you talk. Make your point. I, I did the same for Mr. Nelson. I'll do the same for all my opponents. I'm, I'm polite. I'm a gentleman. I let them talk. I don't shout over them or interrupt them mid-sentence. Gotcha. Every, watch, the, watch the discussion I did with R and Ra 288 times in 36 minutes. He can't shut his mouth. Well, I will. Let me okay. shut it. <laughs> let me shut it, and we'll debate. I will ask him. I'll, I'll try to work something out. All right. Thanks for your question, David. And uh, Stupid Horror Energy, as she calls herself. She, thanks for your super chat. She says, Hovind, you say that we don't know if the Bones had any kids. Are you aware of a fossil from China of an... I forgot how this is pronounced. It's been a long time. Ichiosaur? Mother giving birth. Is that pronouncing it right? Ichthyosaur, but it's Ichthyosaur. pretty close. Thank you. So, yes, I'm well aware of it. I've got a picture. I use it in my seminar. We have a picture of a, a fossil of a, a fish-like animal giving birth. And guess what the baby looks like? The mother. And I, I say, as I said, five or six points, you can't prove those bones had any kids that lived. Did that baby fish live? No, we found the fossil of it. It died. Okay. Did Gosh. it have kids that were different? No, it looked just like its mother. Is, they're, they're just, that's my point. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you very much. I don't know if, uh, folks, this is all my fault. Like, I'm so sorry. We can try to read through these uh, Super Chats as fast as humanly possible, which we will do in a second. But uh, then <coughs> we'll have to wrap up pretty quick because I did promise the next debaters. And then I usually promise Kent that we'll try to wrap up within an hour, which we've totally gone over tonight. Sorry about that. But, I mean, she, he was enjoying his talk with Erica. She's a pleasant person. Oh, thank it, you. I'm glad, I, to, glad to be here. It was. Am I really that bad? Okay, so anyway, <laughs> we appreciate both of our speakers being here. And uh, I'm going to try to make this as quick as possible. Robert Summer says, I'm going... Oh, yes. Thank you, Robert, for your criticism. I appreciate that. Uh, oh, let's see. Oh, on Helton's children. Can we go back to school yet? We miss our friends. I'm confused, but thank you for your super chat. Next up, Jay Shy said, Kent, the real reason we have a nested hierarchy is due to speciation. If speciation didn't happen, everything would be microevolution. The same species. We don't have that. Speciation creates all macro. If you want to have a chance to respond to that, you can, of course, Kent. He thinks the, the variations we see that they're calling a new species is enough evidence to be evidence for macroevolution where it becomes a different kind of animal. So we see, what, 30, 339 breeds of dogs have been created, mostly created, not evolved or developed by themselves. 
and that's proof that uh, dogs and mosquitoes are related. That's, I, I think, way off the charts on the stupid end. Gotcha. Really quick. Thanks for your super chat. Franks92 said, great job, Erica. Hope to see more. So a lot of people have been saying, hey, you should bring on Erica again. So it sounds like they oh, I'd it. love to. I'd love to come on. Anybody who wants to talk uh, human evolution, age of the earth, or, or just primates. I love talking about primates. Uh, fellow, shoot me a message on, on YouTube or whatever. A fellow named Standing for Truth already asked. So uh, thanks, for your, <laughs> thanks for your uh, question. Sarah said, paper wasps have evolved facial recognition codes easily. Or they said, paper wasps have evolved facial recognition. Codes easily evolve in nature. I think that's for Kent. Paper wasps have facial recognition. You mean they, is this guy raising them for pets or something? I, I don't, I'd like to see what he's talking about. I don't understand. They, but uh, if you I see, might be able to add a little bit of clarity. They, sorry for interrupting, Kent. Just they, go they ahead, no, go for colonies, so they recognize one another. Like any kind of social living animal tends to have pretty good facial recognition. Uh, so that they can kind of uh, know who each other are, who's who's kin, who's family, who's not. Um, but I'm not really sure what the what the rest of the question was. Sorry. How on earth did they figure out that the wasps can recognize each other? How, how do you know they're recognizing facial? Re <laughs> okay, and that proves we all came from a rock. All right, tell them tell them enjoy himself. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Next up. Speeding through, Jay Shy, appreciate the, your, your super chat. They said, a kind will bring forth, ye uh, but yet the Alaska rabbit and Florida rabbit cannot. Um, they say, also the image of God means we are to Im image him. Nothing materialist, Kent, Bible doesn't make scientific claim. I assume that's for me. He is correct. The Alaska rabbit and the Florida rabbit cannot interbreed probably because of the seasonal cycles, okay? Uh, they can both interbreed with the Minnesota rabbits, which is interesting, but I'd like to point out to the obvious to a five-year-old, they're all still rabbits. Gotcha, thank you very much. Next up, Ryan, uh, Jay Shai asked another question. They said, we don't have green rabbits because mutations are random. Natural selection can select something or can't select something that isn't there. That, that was my point exactly. It can only select from existing traits. Why aren't there green rabbits? They would blend in great camouflage. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Stupid whore energy for your super chat. She said, is Kent aware of Jingwe, a recently evolved new gene with a different structure and function from its parent? <laughs> Might be. No, I'm not aware. Of yeah, I don't know what they're talking about there. I'd like to see the evidence. I, I would, I'd be willing to bet. McKinsey here who's five would say that's the same kind of animal. Gotcha. Sounds like a cool paper though. I'd love to see it as well. I haven't heard of gotcha. that one. Thank you. And next up, Sigifredo Sarabia in the house. He says, Erica, how do cells learn or know anything such as communicating with one another in a random process, even if you include mutations? Well, it's all chemicals. I mean, that's, that's you know, biochemistry. I had to take an undergrad. It was terrible. But generally, what, what we learned, the takeaway that I had, is that basal communication is really just chemical signals and chemicals reacting to one another, be they chemicals within existing cells, or as some people uh, like to propose, I'm, I'm not 100% sure where I'm at on the whole thing, but that uh, it's, it's actually chemical interactions that spurred RNA world hypothesis. So I don't know. Good question, but answer chemicals. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Next up, super chat from Stupid Whore Energy who says, Sigifredo, so he just asked that last question uh, before. She says, that would be through chemical signals. Namely, that's how cells communicate with each other. Terry James. Oh. Terry James, thanks for your super chat. They said the human body is 60% water. Thank you very much, Translator Cranium. For your super chat, that wasn't an eye roll, by the way. I was not rolling my eyes. I was only doing that because I was waiting for a response. To I wasn't sure if anybody's going to respond. Translator Carmin Carminum, thanks for your super chat. They said, Kent, at the beginning, you said Erica was, quote unquote, indoctrinated and then immediately quoted the Bible. Do you by any chance see the irony here? Got a critic, no, Kent. I sure, I sure don't. Oh, are we done? No. Okay. I just. Uh, no, 
I, I can read and decide if I want to believe something. I read Darwin's book. I decided that's stupid. I'm not going to believe that. So it's not indoctrinated. I wasn't forced to believe anything. I've read the Bible many times for 51 years now. Uh, I'd be willing to take a, a debate on that if they would like. Uh, I think nothing has ever been disproven from that book. That book says 20 times in the first seven chapters that the plants and animals bring forth after their kind. That's what it says. Gotcha. Does he have any evidence to the contrary? I'd like to see the evidence to the contrary. Looks to me like that's a scientific statement. They're going to bring forth after their kind. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Next up, Sister Fredo Sarabia, thanks for your question. He said, can't you always critique atheists for believing they came from rocks? Why is it not a non sequitur if Scripture says Adam ma was made of the clay? What's the difference? It's a ginormous difference. Cars are made of iron, but they don't make themselves out of the iron. Intelligent people make them out of the iron. For say that rocks can turn to humans by themselves with no intelligence is dumb. To say that an intelligent creator can take the material and produce a human, well, that's the same as a car being produced by people or somebody cutting down a tree and making wood and making a house. A designer made man out of the dirt. They want me to believe nobody made man out of the dirt. That's the difference. Gotcha. Thank you so much uh, for your... Ooh, we're getting lost here. Oh, there it is. Uh, let's see. Josiah Hansen, thanks for your super chat. He said, does Erica have a Twitter? Great job tonight, Erica. I love a Twitter. Every time I get on it, I get frustrated that I can't get followers fast, and then I quit. So, <laughs> not yet, but maybe. I don't know. Would this person follow me? Super chat again. It sounds like they would. I will put it in the description if Erica has it after the debate. Andrew T., thanks for your super chat. Uh, bring, they said, bring Erica on more often. She's supernatural. Awesome. P.S. Will you marry me? JK, JK. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the, the compliment. I'd love to come on again. I'll, I'll talk to anybody about anything, really. That's nice. Who was, who was that? Thanks for your, that super chat, Steven Seen or no, no, sorry. It was some, okay. Patreon question from Brian Stevens. They said, uh, thanks for your support, Brian. He said, Kent said his CV is on Dr. Dino in his last debate. I went there and his CV isn't there. Where can we find Kent's CV or resume? My PD or resume? I don't understand. CV like, CV like curriculum vitae, I think they mean. Like, like resume. Like resume. I, I give my testimony many, many times. My website is drdino.com, D-R-D-I-N-O. I'll be glad to answer any questions. They can call 855-BIG-DINO, extension 3. I guess he need to clarify the question. Is he wanting to know uh, what I believe on certain topics? I think I make that real clear in my in my presentation. I think, uh, I think so he I, means like a resume, like, you know, like where you like past history, experience, like degrees, all that. Well, I have I had my daddy was a Marine World War Two and taught us boys everything. You know, he came home and had three sons and a daughter. And he taught us how to I've built nine houses. I've uh, taught high school science and math 15 years, algebra, geometry, trig, biology, earth science, physical science. I had to teach one semester of uh, uh, anatomy because the teacher was sick. I enjoyed it, but I had a lot to learn in that. I mean, I, I enjoy teaching it and learning it. but. What does he want to know specifically? Uh, I've done a lot of mechanic work. I've had 135 cars. I can do just about anything to a car. Uh, so I've built houses. I'm not real good with uh, having babies. I didn't have any. Uh, my wife did. But uh, so there's probably some limits in there somewhere. But what, what do they want to know? I don't understand. I can come back to this. I just got to quick make an announcement to let people know I'm so sorry, friends, that for the last Super Chats, like the last few that have come in, I can't read them because I just want to wrap up um, both for – getting our speakers out of here in a timely fashion and because I have a, another debate scheduled in six minutes. Um, so s I'm going to read the last ones we have. Uh, we've only got two. Uh, Terry wow. James, thanks so much for your super chat. And I'm so sorry for anybody who sent it. If you want, seriously, I'll Venmo you the money back seriously. Um, Cause I know that you guys are expecting to be read. <sighs> Terry James, appreciate your super chat. He said, Kent have a rabbit population changed to the point where it didn't have long ears. Would it no longer be a rabbit? Well, if a rabbit grew wings and could fly, just imagine, would it no longer be a It doesn't happen. <laughs> why, why are we going down that rabbit trail anyway? It doesn't happen. 
Gotcha. <laughs> It's been a great time tonight, folks. I want to remind you that both Kent and Erica have their links in the description. So if you've enjoyed what you've heard, you can hear more at their links below. It's been a pleasure. Thank you guys very much for being here with us tonight. Awesome. Thanks for having, Thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody out there for your questions. Hope you guys take care. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. And G-Man will be on next. If you want to see G-Man debate an atheist friend, uh, Johnny, the atheist, is going to be on for the first time. Remember, the Force will be with you always. Take care, everybody.